Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Well, we recently had local elections, and yet to come this year, we'll have uh, elections in August with primaries and a midterm election in November. But despite the elections, politics continue to be a topic year-round. And joining me today, three representatives from the Political Science Department here, professors, to share some insight. We met back in November or so. We're kind of following up now about halfway through this year. Will Delahanty, Nicole Schoff, and Nicholas Nicoletti. Thank you for being here today. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you. I'm sure in each of your fields are areas of emphasis that you've seen a lot of interesting things happen as far as in the world of politics and political science. Uh, yes, I think that's probably an understatement. <laughs> I mean, given the current environment, um, you know, probably the one that dominates, at least in my area, uh, and I think in Dr. Schoff's is, um, you know, President Trump. And so mm -hmm. um, kind of um, how he's governing nationally, some of the shakeups that you're seeing in his cabinet, um, and then down ballot effects, as you mentioned, you know, in kind of the introduction um, with congressional midterms. Okay. And of course, locally, there's a lot of things happening as well. You're probably observing what's happening statewide and locally as well. Absolutely. So some of it's a sort of down ballot effects, and some of it's just local issues that aren't a, aren't a big issues at the state or national level. Mm -hmm. um, and with the recent April uh, elections here in Jasper and Newton counties, and we saw some really interesting movements in policy as well. And everything kind of ties together in the international scene, the national scene, you're yes. seeing a lot there as well. Yeah, we have a, a bit of a trade war kind of going mm -hmm. on uh, between the United States and China and the increase in tariffs. And the, then there's a renegotiation in NAFTA. And then the Syrian civil war is still raging. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of things going on in that area as well. So with all of this going on, do you, as professors, hear your students talking about things more? I mean, it seems like you pick, I can't pick up the newspaper, turn on the TV without hearing something. Yeah, I think, um, at least in my case, um, in teaching our American government course and then upper division courses in kind of American politics, um, the students do are more aware of kind of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, although there are times when I have to kind of remind them of kind of events that are occurring, um, those sorts of things. But yeah, I think they tend to be uh, kind of generally more interested. It might just be that kind of effect of, I think, the national media focus on Trump and, and kind mm -hmm. of the consequences of you know, what's going on nationally. Um, but yeah, they do seem to be more aware and more interested, too. Now, now we talked also about the students becoming informed by getting valuable, they're using the right sources for their news. Are you getting any senses that's changing? Or students, are, you know, where do they go to get the information? <laughs> they get a lot of their information via social media. And so it's always a challenge and a lot of discussions mm -hmm. we have to have about media literacy, learning about how do you distinguish between quality news sources on social media versus things that have been sponsored maybe by a corporation mm -hmm. or by some sort of unethical news organization. And so that's a constant challenge. But when you can provide them with good sources that they can go to that are reliable across the ideological spectrum, um, they do seem to appreciate. And they do, I found that students do tend to then use those sources in addition mm -hmm. to what they're experiencing. Most news organizations have Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds anyway. Right. And so it's just connecting students with the existing resources. Of course, the students, and then you have the traditional media still out there giving information to people. Thank you. Yeah, and the crossover is the best, right? When you get the official news organizations coming through the social media, mm -hmm. that, that helps. But, you know, I think students are, are even more aware of, um, n you know, what can happen with fake news and bias, uh, mm -hmm. given the Cambridge Analytica, you know, Facebook breach, and Mark Zuckerberg is out there now sort of apologizing. And so, you know, I teach a, basically a technology and politics class, and this is one of the things we've been talking about for, for a long time now mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, this new way of getting news can, you know, bias and alter public opinion. We've heard a lot of um, confrontations through the media, whether you talk about partisan type politics coming out through the media or the students commenting about this as well, that you've got the left, you have the right, you know, then the, the represented by the media perhaps now. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the media has a tendency to kind of mirror the polarization that you see from, I guess, at least, but it's also kind of interesting. I mean, the media wants to heighten conflict, I mean, in part mm -hmm. to kind of attract viewers or readers right. and that sort of thing. So um, to Dr. Shove's point, I mean, the idea of becoming more aware of kind of the media that you use and why you use it really tends to be important for navigating kind of the, the polarized politics that we have and you know, cr recreated by the mass media. Well, let's talk about some of the things that stand out in your mind. We, I mentioned at the start local elections, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that as well. We're just off a week or so. City councils are swearing in new people. What were some of your views or uh, observations when you looked at what happened locally? I think one of the most interesting topics that came up in the spring elections this year were, were the use taxes. Mm -hmm. Five separate jurisdictions in the area voted on use taxes, which would apply the local sales tax to online purchases. Um, which would help make up for the fact that so many of us are shopping online. Mm -hmm. at, on uh, So places like Amazon already collect a state level sales tax, but they don't collect local sales tax. So if the city of Joplin has tax. a sales tax, they're not getting anything from Correct. Mm -hmm. And so if Joplin were to, in the future, adopt a use tax, they'd be able to pick up that lost revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and so four places voted on it, um, but only it only passed in one location. Uh, Duquesne adopted a local use tax that's equivalent to their sales tax for their online purchases 
but the measure only won by seven votes. It was a seven vote margin. And so if you're ever gonna make the argument that participation in local politics matters, that mm -hmm. you can make the difference, you and your six best friends could have flipped the election <laughs> in this case, mm -hmm. uh, which is smaller than your average dinner party. You can fit seven people in a car. Um, and so that was a really interesting thing. And we always hear about low voter turnout. The local elections tend to always have that image as well. Yeah, they get far less news coverage. Um, they're not typically as sexy as national politics. Mm -hmm. so they're only smaller news outlets pay attention to it, um, which is fair. Um, but it's also the easiest place for individual voters to make a real impact on their community and directly on their very own pocketbooks. Now, the city of Joplin had nine people running for council. Do you feel that was a good, you know, good representation of people are interested, at least candidate-wise, wanting that job? It is nice, although not all the races were equally contested, mm -hmm. um, right? So I, I think it'd be nice to see more candidates and maybe a more diverse set of candidates. Uh, many of the candidates that we had were well qualified, right? It was not like right. we were, we didn't have good people to choose from. Um, but it would be nice to see a, a wider variety of our population represented on the city council. Now you mentioned the financial challenges cities are facing, you know, revenue declining because we aren't going to the stores to buy things. States and even the federal government still continue looking at budgets and how do we handle that? You know, well, Missouri being a prime example, they're trying to get the budget through the House and, the, and to, or through the House now to the Senate. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, and kind of more broadly, I mean, you're talking about a tax environment. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, you know, kind of nationally, you've got these tax cuts right, which are going right. into effect. Um, so that, that it's kind of interesting. I mean, state and I'm sorry, the federal and the state governments have to kind of figure out how to kind of um, pay for those things which they presumably would want to provide, but nevertheless um, do them at a kind of, a, I guess you would say, a reduced cost. So it's really very difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a question of priorities, I mean, more than anything else. And you were saying, well, we'll give more money back to people to spend, but then we still have these expenses. Right. Um, and so, I mean, there's kind of debate about um, what is it that we need to fund, how should we fund it? I mean, you've got questions about national defense, um, mm -hmm. and you've got other questions at the state level about basic programs, education, et cetera, um, things that would directly affect Missouri Southern. So um, it's really about how legislators view their interests and ultimately what they're willing to do and not do. So as you're looking now at, for instance, Jefferson City, the debate that's going on, you know, how are we going to split this piece of pie that only has so many pieces yeah, in it? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so, I mean, there are, you know, lots of different interests that would want, you know, some of, the, some of those resources, higher education being an example of that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really a question of, you know, what the state kind of views, I think, long term in terms of um, fiscal viability. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, in the case of the states, generally, I mean, you have more fiscal constraints than you see at the federal level. So the questions about national debt, et cetera, also, right, still apply right. Um, and looking at, you know, uh, federal tax balls. And we've heard that a lot. The federal government can spend as much as they want. Nobody's going after them to control that. Yeah, and they've, you know, raised the debt ceiling and borrow from abroad. And mm -hmm. I think this is a really important political point is that, you know, cutting things is never popular, right, because you're hurting a constituency. And so, you know, you look for things um, to cut that might not have an overwhelming uh, effect on your, you know, your next vote. At the national level, you know, President Trump has, you know, spearheaded this tax cut, but at the same time, he's also spearheaded infrastructure spending, um, border security, mm -hmm. and then a massive increase in, in defense spending. And, and, you know, we just got some economic data out very recently that suggests that the United States is going to have one of the largest budget deficits that it's, that it's had in a long time coming up precisely because of the lower taxes but increased spending. And so we see this happening. Mm -hmm. Of course, on the national, those spending things, defense and so forth, that doesn't stop at the borders. You know, obviously, we have the National Guard guarding borders now, mm -hmm. but you're talking about na international relations as well. We have troops still all over the world and potentially more going different places. That's right, and that's uh, very costly. And then, you know, in addition to that, you know, now we have sort of this anti-globalization, you know, anti-trade sentiment, and the United States has levied tariffs on, on steel, and then there was uh, reciprocal tariffs now levied by China on the United States, and really what that's going to do is increase um, consumer prices. That, that is mm -hmm. the effect of a trade war, is to increase prices. And so the benefits of a trade war are, are, are very small compared to the massive cost that gets spread out among everybody, and with lower taxes and higher prices, you know, that's cause for some structural concerns, I think. When people watch the news and or they follow the, I mean, people with investments watch the stock market, you're putting together your retirement portfolio and you see it going up and down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, did you think the public's going to start asking what's really going on? One day my stocks are up, the next day they're way down, you know? <laughs> well, well I, I, mean, I mean, to Dr. McLeod's point, I mean, I think the, the um, actually the, the, the political question, right, I mean, uh, of why a president would, you know, kind of pursue massive increases in spending and mm -hmm. then, you know, kind of have, rev you know, revenue deductions or reductions um, is really interesting. But I think for the everyday consumer, um, I mean, he, Dr. McLeod is right. I mean, 
mean, so if your prices increase as a function of a, a policy of the federal government or you know trade policy, um, it might create political consequences, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for right, uh, President Trump and the Republicans as they go into not only 2018 but beyond. Right in 2020, sure. um, so there might be some fairly negative consequences they haven't yet considered, or at least unintended consequences, right of their policy choice. Mm -hmm. And of course, the people who are producing the items that are being then taxed or tar the tariffs in China, that we hear a lot about the soybeans and the corn and so forth that we send overseas, mm -hmm. the, were they people that may have been strong supporters of President Trump when he was elected? As a matter of fact, the, the news media is reporting quite um, consistently about farmers, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly Midwestern farmers here, you know, farmers here in Missouri, um, who are uh, frustrated, right, with a policy that presumably is going to hurt them and a loss of jobs. Um, and so, you know, politically, the degree to which, right, these kind of imposition of um, trade restrictions ultimately will hurt, right, the Republicans mm -hmm. and President Trump um, kind of with their core constituency. So it's an interesting political dynamic, despite the economic rhetoric, right, of President Trump. So beyond the immediacy of what's going to happen in the long term also ties into right, that. Right, exactly. And if you're thinking about the long term budget, you can't forget the entitlement programs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. An enormous chunk of the federal budget goes to Social Security and Medicare programs, right. and they're not being properly funded. Right. And so you really, there's no practical way to get into a bad, balanced budget mm -hmm. in the absence of a serious look towards entitlement reform at the national level. Mm -hmm. Which is a difficult question in and of itself. Yeah. And do you feel Absolutely. that since this is an election year for many people in Congress, they don't want to touch those types of topics? I don't know that there's ever a time they do want to touch them, politically <laughs> speaking. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would, I would be incredibly shocked if there was any discussion of that mm -hmm. uh, over the next few months um, because of the midterms coming up. But we also don't have any genuine hope of making significant progress in the budget without it. So there's a lot of pieces that haven't fallen in place to help solve these situations. Well, the challenges. Yeah, that I mean, you still have mm -hmm. ongoing debates about health care. I mean, mm -hmm. you still um, you have questions about Medicare. You have questions about Social Security, um, right. as Dr. Schoff was kind of mentioning. So um, there's a lot of challenges, right, that, that we face, and it's really difficult I mean, to address them right within any kind of reasonable time frame, particularly before 2018. So this year being a key year with the elections, the issues that we're facing. At the beginning of the program, you mentioned some of the interna international aspects of, uh, you know, the trade war, and then we keep hearing about Russia and the United States relations, and now Syria and North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think people are expressing more concerns of what, what's happening to us in the world, or where, how does this fit in there? It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, if you look at, so, you know, if you look at, you know, the way Americans viewed the Soviet Union and Russia during the Cold War, mm -hmm. it, was, it was negative. The American rhetoric was very negative. And now, um, with, with the Trump campaign and the Trump presidency, um, we've actually seen uh, public approval for Republicans towards Russia increase over time, uh, and Democrats have yet gone lower. Um, and, and I think this stems from you know, the, the idea of uh, possible collusion and the, and the Mueller investigation and things like that. Um, but it is also true that at the same time, Russia is involved in some of the biggest hotspots that the United States uh, has strategic interest in. So if you look at Syria, Russia and Iran are there. We're, we're under, we're talking about removing troops right now from Syria, but we're also talking about possibly striking them for the chemical weapons attack. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, you know, Russia is also in Crimea and has kind of annexed that. And that's a really big discussion for about, you know, about the United States' duty to defend Western Europe from the old Cold, Cold War time uh, and Eastern Europe. And so I think, you know, these things are hard to un untangle. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think most Americans are definitely still worried about a multipolar world, not just the Russian threat, but also other rising powers like China. What about the North Korea situation? That seems to be some people have scratched their heads. Now, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be enemies? Yeah. Now we're going to sit down and talk to them? <laughs> well, I think it actually, if you look at the way um, North Korea negotiations have over time, this is actually normal. This is mm -hmm. this is quite um, you know normal. Uh, it's usually hard rhetoric to, to in the beginning. Um, then eventually, the United States will sit down, give some concessions, uh, sort of help the North Korean economy in concession for a halt of the program, and then um, the Kim regime will go back on their word and will go back into this sort of this sort of cycle. And so, if you look at the early 2000s, there was something called the Six Party Talks, where the United States and China and Russia and others got together, and and it worked for a little while, but then you know uh, they went back on that deal. And so, this is this is actually quite in line with historical negotiations with North Korea. What about the rhetoric, rhetoric we're hearing of the North Koreans say, we have a missile that can hit the United States now, we never had that. Is that playing a new role in that type of discussion? I think so. It's, it's a much bigger deterrence role. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think it goes beyond rhetoric. Uh, most analysts ha um, believe that North Korea now has nuclear capability and, and credibility. In other words, they can strike further and further. Their ICBMs are better. They're using solid fuel instead of liquid fuel. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's so many different uh, improvements in their nuclear capability that, that I think they do need to be taken more seriously now 
than they ever have been, which gives them more leverage in negotiations, which is precisely what they were going for. Now, at the same time, we have international things. We have, it seems like you hear a lot of uh, turmoil sometimes in the White House or changing mm -hmm. of the guard and mm -hmm. different positions and so forth. How is that playing a role <laughs> into trying to keep things under control around the um, world? Well, well, I mean, from, from my vantage point, it suggests that President Trump um, kind of has a difficult time maybe maintaining, right, a core set of advisors, mm -hmm. um, particularly with respect to kind of foreign affairs. Uh, and so, um, I mean, you have Josh Bolton, right, who's becoming, you know, a new member, right, of his kind of inner circle um, with a very distinct view towards Iran, for mm -hmm. example. Um, so I, I think the, the turmoil in the White House kind of suggests difficulty governing, um, which also can translate into difficulty in working with Congress um, on the president's domestic agenda, let alone right trying to get Congress to, if you will, kind of support right the president with respect to foreign policy. So mm -hmm. consistency in advising and consistency right in kind of um, people who staff the White House tend to seem to work better th than the alternative. And we hear a lot of people sometimes complain about all those partisan politics. They are just jabbing each other, but nobody's willing to sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a trend? Or uh, what's been a long-term kind of serial <laughs> right. trend? Uh, I mean, so I, I mean, the the whole notion that our 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 politics is more polarized. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's actually kind of an interesting debate um, in academic literature about the, the origin right, of that polarization. Um, but it's probably not going away given, I mean, in part, the, the function of how electoral districts are designed, let's say, mm -hmm. at state level for Congress. So I think those things are going to kind of be maintained. I mean, the, the interesting mm -hmm. question is whether or not you could see compromise. I mean, I think we, we could try. I mean, it's always good to be optimistic, right? <laughs> um, and so but someone's got to take that first step to have the yeah, compromise. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> exactly. exactly. We've seen some success in the modern era of compromise, even mm -hmm. in a polarized era, right? So we had a, a big budget crisis a couple years ago, and the women of the of the U.S. Senate were able to work together to, to pull out a compromise. And mm -hmm. so there are circumstances mm -hmm. under which, which is to say it is extremely polarized, mm -hmm. but there are circumstances under which some members are able to work together. And sometimes it takes a different group of people uh, to approach that. And this is one of those interesting things that we see when you have a more diverse legislature, mm -hmm. there's more diversity within the parties, mm -hmm. which lends itself to inter-party cooperation. More people willing to talk to the other side of the aisle, yeah, <laughs> as absolutely. I say, working together. So you have the national situation, then you have the state of Missouri where we have a Republican governor, we still have a Republican legislature, mm -hmm. and it seems like they're still butting heads many times. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that this has gone uh, according to plan. Um, there was a lot of optimism uh, among Republican legislators uh, on the eve of Governor Greitens inauguration, mm -hmm. um, that after eight years of a, of a Democratic governor, they would have unified government in Missouri, and that these policies that they'd been interested in passing over the past few years, that they would finally would have traction. Um, that's not worked out quite the way they anticipated. They have been able to pass some things, mm -hmm. um, but Governor Greitens has a different approach to governing than I think the state legislature intended. Um, plus, there are some other factor, political factors that are sort of distracting uh, Capitol Hill here in Missouri as well. well. Of course, the whole investigation into the governor and being yes. charged, and the, do you think that's being a major deterrent in Jeff City, that people are, you know, well, they've got this little story over here brewing, well, how can we talk over here? Well, I mean, I mean as Dr. Schoff was saying, I mean, it's a distraction. I mean, mm -hmm. but it's also a great way for um, the legislature to resist, uh, if they wanted to, right, some mm -hmm. of the, the policies and goals of Governor Greitens. Um, so it gives the Republicans some kind of daylight if they want to do something different than the governor, although, I mean, you know, I was kind of mentioning, I mean, you would think they'd have kind of shared interests on a lot of different things. So um, in part, that, that kind of um, that issue that Governor Greitens is dealing with, right, makes it harder, I think, uh, for him to ultimately kind of lead the legislature for that matter, right, to always seek cooperation from fellow Republicans. Do you find students talking about that? I mean, we can you can pick up any St. Louis, Kansas City newspaper. Joplin. Sometimes there's a story in there almost on a day. This is the latest thing to come out on the investigation or the court case that's coming up. Absolutely, I'm actually teaching state and local politics this semester, and so we spend a tremendous amount of time talking about what's going to state and the local level. But even in my American government mm -hmm. classes, um, the news has trickled in. They, it's mostly them coming with questions: mm -hmm. what is what is going on? What's what's going on with Governor mm -hmm. Greitens? And what is this committee that's been formed? And so, but it is trickling in because it's interesting and it's mm -hmm. being picked up by the national news media, right. which is not necessarily good for Missouri politics. Um, the image when, nationwide. <laughs> yeah, when state politics in Missouri get sort of brought into sort of the national discussion, when you show up in the Washington Post, something mm -hmm. has usually gone wrong. Right. Um, it's not It's not usually a story of state politics, good it's a good Missouri, governance, yes. <laughs> right? Um, because, you know, most news media in the United States is a business. You need mm -hmm. to sell sexy stories. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Governor Greitens, has a series of sexy stories um, that make for excellent news. And so I, it's actually, I think both uh, President Trump and Governor Greitens have been good uh, for student engagement. Mm -hmm. I agree uh, with that. If, 
if nothing else. Yeah. Well, and then you also have this really interesting kind of um, senatorial election, right, with Claire McCaskill mm -hmm. and being challenged by uh, Josh Hawley. Um, so, you know, a, an incumbent with lots of cash uh, and ultimately, you know, kind of maybe facing a difficult right, re-election. So that's another mm -hmm. kind of interesting race to kind of keep our eyes on as we get into 2018. Right, we're recording this mm -hmm. in April. You yeah. have the, the primaries in August. I'm sure you're probably going to see a lot more, this advertising just trickling now, but you're going to have a lot of people hard hitting in advertising. Yes, yes. I mean, they're already, I mean, I've already seen advertisements regarding, you know, uh, Senator McCaskill's not supporting, right, the, the tax cuts and kind of it's, mm -hmm. um, the conclusion is, is that, that she didn't support Missouri families by doing so. So, I mean, you would imagine that advertising would increase substantially as we kind of get later into the election season. The Missouri Senate race is going to be a, a good one to watch yeah. this year, as it was um, when Claire McCaskill ran yeah. for re-election the last time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting. N nationally, there's probably some key, re I mean, everybody keeps saying, are we going to have red states or blue states? You know, there's, there's the change going on. You know, there's a lot of worry about that around the country. Um, well, you know, the Senate is probably less likely to, to, to be changed, although, I mean, you've got people like Claire McCaskill, who presumably as an incumbent, um, you know, would be, be more safe. I guess the, the more open question is whether or not the House, right, mm -hmm. is going to be subject to the so-called blue wave, right, where you have Democrats winning, right, seats, um, maybe not from Republicans, but I mean, you saw special elections, you know, People going recently, yeah, mm -hmm. where you would see, right, Democrats, um, like in Alabama, for example, right, winning elections. So that might give us an indication of what would come in November. It's not unusual for a president's party right. in the midterm election to lose seats anyway, right. under normal political conditions. Right. The question becomes, do they lose enough seats that it flips control of either chamber of right. Congress? Right. You still have that balance of who mm -hmm. has the power within those mm -hmm. legislative mm -hmm. bodies and so forth. Well, looking at the international aspect as far as balance and political relations, you know, we have a lot of countries that maybe used to be, quote, friends, but now they're questioning their relation with the U.S.? Or? Well, I think, um, I think under the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, there was this souring of relations between America and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, the Iraq War played a, a strong role right. in that. Um, under the Obama administration, Obama made it a very uh, special point of his to rebuild um, those multilateral relationships. And I think Trump is again pulling back. And, and I think, um, I don't think the relationships were quite healed, to be honest with you. And so now I do think we see um, on the world stage, we see countries starting to look at the United States as um, possibly a wild card now or not knowing where their policy might go. Um, but even, I think more important, I think we're starting to see that multipolar world, right, where, you know, when the Cold War ended, the United States was, was as they call the hegemon, the superpower. Um, but now we're seeing the rise of other states. And in a multipolar world, other states have the power to make to make action too, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think you're going to see a little bit of pushback. Um, more importantly, I, I think you see other states taking a role in places that they didn't use to take a role. So as President Trump pulls back on something like climate change, you're actually seeing um, uh, Jinping right out of China, Xi Jinping actually say he'll take a leadership role on reducing climate change, you know, mm -hmm. helping With climate change. change. Mm -hmm. And that is interesting because China is one of the biggest polluters. They're and the so, ones with the air pollution, the problem everybody points to. Right. And so a lot of IR scholars are saying that the United States might lose a strategic leadership place by pulling back from things like the Paris climate change, pulling mm -hmm. back from things like the United Nations and UNESCO and some of these other things that the Trump administration has been pulling back from. Of course, we hear so much about the global economy, and for John Q. Public living in Joplin, Missouri, what's happening internationally, they're saying, well, how does that affect me? That <laughs> yeah, but it does. It definitely has a huge effect. I mean, uh, the $100 billion in tariffs, in retaliatory tariffs that China, uh, you know, and then the Trump administration are going back and forth on, mm -hmm. that's going to raise prices, right? And so I think a lot of misperception on trade is that trade is bad because it takes away jobs. But in the actual, you know, scheme of things, this idea of comparative advantage, that was brought up by David Ricardo and Adam Smith demonstrates that if, you, if a country specializes in what it does best, it can actually produce more of that good and then have all of the countries produce more and then exchange, and it would reduce prices, increase supply. Uh, it's good for the American consumer to enter into free trade agreements. I think the misperception of that is, is causing a lot of the turmoil. Trump's able to capitalize on uh, this idea that trade is bad. And, and in the end, it will hurt the American consumer. In the Midwest, the West Coast, the East Coast, all prices will go up. So you're talking about inflation affecting people's ability to save money, to buy houses and things that, I mean, the whole long chain of what's affected by that. Well, and Dr. Gladding brings up a good point. I mean, it's really important for the public to distinguish between a fact and rhetoric. So mm -hmm. if, if the consequences of the trade policy is such that it's actually going to hurt the American public, I mean, it's important to really know that distinction. And um, I think he's right. We don't necessarily always get enough information to 
make an informed choice. And politically, it works much easier um, to make the argument for Trump against right, um, trade as opposed to mm -hmm. you know being in, for, in favor of it. So. Well, he was on his running for office. He was saying we need to focus on America. Yes, I mean, I mean he's he, following he, up on what he said, right? And he, he he kind of capitalized that with you know decline in manufacturing jobs, winning kind of the industrial upper Midwest, you mm -hmm. know, an area where we thought you know Clinton would do well. So. Um, I mean, Dr. Letty's right. I mean, we need to kind of make sure the public understands, you know, the consequences of policy. So a lot of people are watching what's happening. We're coming up on primaries and midterm elections. Um, you feel that there's, politics are going to continue to be on the focus, not only nationally, but even locally, some of these issues like the use tax and uh, what are we going to do in Missouri about gas tax and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, it has to. I mean, politics always has to play a starring role because even if you don't find it fun, right, if you're not sort of one of us who just sort of <laughs> enjoys it as a game to watch, it, it impacts your daily life, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you find it fascinating or interesting or enjoyable to engage with, it impacts you. If we raise the gas tax that will help us improve roads and bridges, but you will pay more at the pump. If we choose not to extend a use tax here in Joplin, um, that's fine. You can buy stuff online and evade use taxes from some websites, mm -hmm. which is great for your pocketbook, but it means that the city of Joplin has less money to spend on things like parks that are very popular and our wonderful trail system and the roads and bridges here in Joplin as well. And so all of these issues, whether, you've, whether you really understand them or not, or whether you find them exciting, uh, they can impact your day-to-day -day life. And so I think if anything, it would be wonderful if people sort of, if you spent a little time so that you can make an informed decision and turn out and vote. Because participating, when you can have a local election where mm -hmm. seven people make, make the, the difference, difference. <laughs> and they set policy for hundreds, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard not to make the argument that you can literally change the outcome of something in your community just by showing up one afternoon. So become informed, pay attention to those valid sources of information. <laughs> so like this news program, for example, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the, for, so not just students at Missouri Southern, mm, sure. John Q. Public of watching course. that they have a responsibility as a citizen, a voter, to find out what's happening. Yeah, they do. They do, and they have a, you know, kind of a responsibility also to kind of think about right the, the information that they get. Mm -hmm. I mean, your point earlier about um, how people are going to be affected by policy, I mean, it's that personal consequence that really mm -hmm. should try to motivate people to think critically and kind of think through, right, the choices that they're going to make at the ballot box or, you know, what they're going to support. What so. does this mean for me? Yeah, exactly. exactly. And for others, too. I mean, mm -hmm. Dr. Schultz's mm -hmm. point about mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, your decision making in the context of a broader community is also quite important. Right. The person yeah. who lives down the street, you exactly. know, if this decision is made, then exactly. they're depending on this type of program, how exactly. that's going to affect them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. well, I'd like to thank the three of you for visiting with us today, providing some information for our viewers. I enjoy this chance to sit and chat and kind of do a political update for people. <laughs> and maybe we can follow up as we go through in the fall as things are really gearing up for the general election in November and see, you know, what's happened over the summer and what's still to come. It'd be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week on Newsmakers. I'm Judy Stiles. Hope you can join me again next week at the same time on this station. We'll see you then.